Karma lets my hand go as soon as we enter the margin, and then bows politely to me before heading back to his room. I watch him go, my mind whirling. Does he usually kiss women's hands? No, I don't think so. Chapter 6, Matchmaking. Oh, God. You really are a handful. But a delightful handful. His words keep repeating in my head. I cannot stop hearing his voice and feeling his lips on my hand. My face feels warm, and every time I think about his words, my heartbeat feels unsteady. I really have to stop thinking about that. Karma is karma, and he puts that overly polite act with everyone. But then I'm pretty sure I've never seen him do something like that with another person. I'll just go downstairs and stop thinking about all this. I need to tell Parfait and Dolore what happened. Because of the time I'd returned to the margin yesterday, I never spoke to anyone about what happened. Maybe someone's downstairs. Someone usually is. I leave my room and make my way downstairs to the reception. It is quiet when I enter, but not as silent as I thought it would be. Karma is sitting at one of the tables, speaking quietly, Parfait and Dolora. His injured hand is sitting on the table, bandage. I cannot help but stare at it, my heart plummeting. His injury is my fault. So you've yet to hear the entire story. No, I'm quite, er, I'm afraid I'm not quite privy to the information Walt has, is that correct? Walt has been directly involved in this far longer than you have. What about Waltz? Princess, you're up early. They all turn to look at me as I stand at the table. Karma looks tired, or he still looks tired and is not in his dress. He looks somber, but still smiles at me. Lucette, how nice of you to join us. When did he start saying my name without my title? Lucette, you've run into a lot of different mishaps this week, haven't you? I thought you would be stubbornly avoiding work. Instead, you go out of your way to get yourself into trouble. This involves me directly. How would I not be curious? You've also been irresponsible, sneaking out without any of us knowing. I have the freedom to do whatever I want. I even wore a cloak, too. Oh, no. The cloak. I left it at the bar. Oh, no. I feel a nudge at my arm and Karma is holding out my cloak with a tired smile. You went back to get this win. Yesterday, when you were still in bed. You've been running yourself dry these last few days, Karma. It's nothing. Thank you. What's this? Our eyes princess is thanking someone? Why is that something so strange? Oh, come on now. She's not so icy. Lucette is more fire than anything. She's filled with unbridled passion and confidence. <laughs> confidence has got me nowhere. Don't look so dear, the doar, Lucette. You've become quite the accomplished woman. <laughs> Karma gestures towards me and I flesh, unsure what, he be unsure what he is talking about. Then I notice that Laura's eyes are on me too. Oh, parfait, do you see that? What are they looking at? I reach down to grab my necklace and then pause. I cannot stop the gas that leaves my lips. Oh, we got a good deed! Oh my god! Oh my god, finally! Was it for, uh... What was it for? Because we didn't get the flash. When did this happen? Princess, you didn't realize that there was an extra piece added to your necklace? Congratulations, Princess Lucette. You're a step closer to breaking your curse. I feel proud. I only ever felt this way around mother. She did a great favor. Or she did me a great favor yesterday. If not for Lucette, I might have been suffocated beneath a pile of, very, of a very excited women. Wait, helping Karma escape was a good deed? She was selfless. He is not even mentioning the injury he got protecting me. Parfait and Dolor are both smiling, but the cheerful mood does not last long. What were you all talking about before I came down? About your kidnapping. Well, kidnappings, both of them. It looks like we have a serious problem on our hands. What do you know about this? What does Waltz know that I don't? Princess, it's more about what everyone else knows that you don't. What everyone else knows. I be or I feel anger begin to shimmer inside of me. Even though he looks apologetic, he says it so casually. What are you all hiding from me? Let's gather everyone later, shall we? I think Waltz might want to be here for this too. What does Waltz have to do with any of it? Be patient, princess. You've already waited this long. What's another few hours? 
<laughs> really? Oh my god. I have no choice but to agree with Parfait and Allura refuse to say any more, but I am not happy about it. I spend the rest of my time doing idle chores around the tavern. I do a round of sleeping with Mr. Broom and mindlessly organize some of the bottles. I cannot believe everyone knows something about me that I don't. But now, I'll find out the entire story. Maybe it'll answer some of the questions I have. But why are they keeping things about me a secret to begin with? I I think I know what it is, but I'm not going to say anything. Dolores gathers everyone in the tavern to discuss the kidnappings. I decide to sit in between Waltz and Karma. So, we have a story to tell. Story time, huh? I don't suppose this would be a romance, would it? How can you stand and make comments like that constantly? How can you stand to live a lie? Oh, oh. The two glare at each other across the table, but Dolores silences them. Dolores starts the story, or starts with a story about the Great War, one of that I have already heard so many times I can recite it myself. What does this have any of this to do with? Uh, what does any of this have to do with me? Because of the fairy tales, which is like myself, were punished for simply existing. Our leader, the Tenebrum Bearer, was a kind witch that was overtaken by the grief that our people suffered. She was driven so far into madness that she created the fairy tale curse to punish humans and make them suffer as the witches had. <gasps> Cause they suffered. Wow, really? And when that wasn't enough, she committed the ultimate the ultimate taboo. She killed a human. I tried to stop her, but by the time I thought to act, it was too late. Knowing that Dolores and Parfait were involved in the Great War makes it seem more real. But wasn't the Tenebrum Bearer killed? How can the fairy tale curse continue to spread if she is dead? I believe that the Tenebrum Bearer sacrificed the last bit of her life to continue powering the Tenebrum. All to ensure that the, that the remaining witches could continue spreading the fairy tale curse. N is none of this ringing a bell for you? What are you talking about? I know what she's talking about. I know what she's talking about. She really did erase your memories. Erase? The witch who died, the Ten of Ambera, was your mother, Princess Lucette. <laughs> what? For some reason, I turn to look at Karma, who is one of the only people who doesn't look away from me. I grew up outside of, the, of this kingdom, but even I knew the terrible witch killed her. You expect me to believe any of this? Mother was... She wasn't a witch. I wouldn't remember that. Well, you would if you had memories of the war in the years before that. Under Hildur's rule, the palace was a dark place. The king didn't have any real power until Hildur was defeated. That goes for the rest of us too. We were slaves to Hildur. Dolores' eyes flicker to Waltz. It's the truth. Waltz nests because he's also- a What? He's a witch? Because he is also a witch. He experienced Hildur's command over the witches firsthand as well. What? Were you like her apprentice or something? Waltz is a witch? Sorry for keeping it a secret, princess. It's not as if I can use much magic anymore anyway, not when I'm cursed. This is just another secret of many. It seems everyone is hiding something. Everyone was freed after Hildur's reign. Witches, fairies, and humans alike. The king was even able to marry Ophelia, the woman he always truly loved. So, it has always been Ophelia that he truly loved? Was that the reason I never felt any love from him? Because I was my mother's daughter? He gave up on me. No, dear, I don't think he- He gave up on me! My voice is too loud in the reception area. I feel it crack beneath the pressure and suddenly I want to cry. But Mother told me so many times not to cry. The king gave up on me. But Mother didn't. Mother would tell me this is all a lie. She would tell me to not trust anyone. They must be lying. I turn to Karma. For some reason, I trust him more than I trust Dolores Parfait. Is this the truth? I was told of the story of Hilda and her daughter, Lucette. They said you were the picture of elegance, but that you shared your mother's icy nature. But I don't think that's true at all. If Hilda was ice, then you most certainly are a warm fire. If my mother was a witch, then what does that make me? You're a witch as well, whether or not you were ever touched to use magic. On your upcoming birthday, you will become the Ten of Moon Bearer. Do you realize how ridiculous this all sounds? Me, a witch? The king never said anything. And now I cannot even ask him if this is the truth because I'm cursed. Why would you even curse me? We didn't want a repeat of the tragedy, Lucette. I sat on yourselves for almost a year, princess. There was ice in your heart, and if you had not inherited the Ten of Barum in that state, who knows what would have happened? Then why didn't you just tell me any of this? 
Dolores and Parfait looks at each other before dropping their gaze to the ground. If we had told you before, would you have even bothered to listen? The king must have tried to do the same thing, and look how that turned out. You shut everyone out who ever tried to tell you about Hildur's true nature. That, that is probably true. Even now, I'm having trouble believing that they are telling me the truth. The whole world feels as if it is collapsing around me. I need to escape. I need to go out and be somewhere else, but why are the witches looking for me? You are the heir to the Ten of Barum. No doubt the evil, is, the evil witches want you on their side so they can t continue wrecking havoc in Angel with the fairy tale curse. The men that were looking for Lucette, though, were, were not witches. They were knights. Perhaps the witches and the knights are working together? Mm. I'm not going to say it, but I know why. This must be part of Alcaster's scene to steal the throne. What are you talking about? The reason why Garland and I left the Order of Calgira was because the king did not believe us about Alcaster's coup. How would he know of the princess's identity, though? Anyone who isn't a fish... A witch, a fairy, or is a curse shouldn't be able to remember her, Fritz. But now we know that it is not the that it is not just the witches looking for the princess, but the knights of the Order of Caldera as well. They definitely have a description of her from someone. Sir Mithras, Lucette. Karma reaches out a hand to touch my shoulder, and I flinch back before standing up. I cannot speak about this now. I want to be alone. Prin. Let her go. She'll need a lot of time to think. I leave everyone sitting at the table as I try to process the whirling thoughts in my mind. Hilda, my mother, the only person I ever thought loved me, was the Ten of Amber, a witch, the first witch to kill a human. The witch that started the fairy tale curse. All this time, I thought Mother was the only one who cared, but what if she never did? I stayed in my room for a long time, trying to process everything I had been told. I feel like her mother... I don't know. Because her mother brainwashed her, and now, like, she erased her memories all of a sudden. Um, I don't know if that was in Rod's route, but... Um, and the fact that Walt is a witch, like, what? Um, but, like... I just... Uh, mm, I don't know. I don't know if her mother ever cared about her or not. Like, I feel like... I don't know. I feel like she did in a motherly way, but it was wrong. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe as we go into different worlds, it'll, like, open up. But, yeah. Days go by before I decide to leave the tavern and watch Karma practice with the knights. These last few days have felt hollow. Maybe seeing the normal practices will help me feel better. Maybe it will make things feel like nothing's changed. When I arrive at the forest, however, only Karma is staring, standing in the clearing. He's staring through the trees as if he sees something there, but his expression is solemn, almost sad. Eventually, he sighs, shaking his head before turning in my direction. Lucette, I prefer myself for a response, but find that no words come to mind. I have not spoken to Karma since the talk about Mother and Witches. And any of the ease I felt with him before has slipped away. Still, I came here on my own, and I cannot just stand here being mute. I see the first thing comes to my mind. Where are Jurian and Garland? I'll only turn with Garland. Jurian is on patrol duty tonight. He'll be here later. I just came early. It seems you did too. Lucette, are you okay? I'm sorry I haven't been by to see you. It's not as it is not as if you owe me that oh owe that to me. I don't owe it to you, but I truly want it to. I've just been busy these last few days scouting the town for, for information. As much as I want you to come with me, why would you have ever wanted to pair up with someone like me anyway? Why, princess? That's because you're... I am bitter and cold, and even though I want to change, all I can think about is myself. But now, I want to change because I do not want to be the same as my mother. Isn't that selfish? Maybe so, but I believe you are being selfish for the right reasons. An entirely selfless person cannot survive in this world. Before we can make others happy, we have to make ourselves happy. Happy? Ourselves? Yes, an angry person holds resentment towards everyone, and it mars whatever good deeds they seek to do. That is why I cannot complete my good deeds. Wrong. You've already got one done. Recognizing the need for change is always a good thing, Lucette. Regardless of the motivation, you are trying to become a better person. That is what matters. 
He takes a step towards me, then puts his hands on my shoulder and leans down until I can look right into his eyes. Karma's serious expression startles me as much as his touch. It is never too late for anyone to change. You taught me that. What? How could I have taught Karma anything? Do you mind if I tell you a story, Lucette? He's standing too close. Oh, do we move? Um... Um, I don't want to move, but you're kind of close. Sorry. I take a step away from him and Karma's hands fall from my shoulders. He sighs out. The story better be just as dramatic as mine. Thank you, Lucette. For what? For agreeing to listen and for what you just did. Stepping away from him? Was I distracting him? Once upon a time in a land far, far away, there lived a crown prince from a kingdom called Brugantia. Ooh, are you a prince? <sighs> Brugantia is one of the neighboring kingdoms, so this isn't make-believe. His name was Claude Adriac Rinaldi Matthias Almonte, but because the name was such a mouthful, he settled for an acronym as, a, as his nickname, at least around the palace where it was acceptable. Claude Adriac Karma? Prince Claw was a man who flaunted his beauty and talents to all that he met. He often used his title to get what he wanted. Prince Claw was a selfish man who felt like he was entitled to everything that he had. He was vain and often left his, left his castle unattended so that he could avoid his responsibilities. Then one day, he chanced upon a beautiful maiden in the town square. He led her around the whole day, being as charming as he could possibly be. And then at the end of the day, he asked the woman to be his lover. She agreed, but their time together did not last long. Only weeks later, Prince Claude threw her away as one throws away an object and broke the woman's heart, and then she cursed him. That beautiful maiden was a witch, but Prince Claude found out too late. The witch said she would make his beauty, his vanity, a curse. To make even a beauty a curse. Ashamed for being cursed, Prince Claude donned a disguise and left his kingdom behind. He has been gone for nearly a year now, most probably assume he is dead. But in truth, the prince had come to Angiel seeking a way to break his curse. He had heard of a young lady named Lucette who on her 18th birthday could dispel any curse. Karma. He looks so sad, I don't know how to comfort him, Claude. Oh, he's blushing. Karma, no, Claude, turns a startling red as he stares at me, and for a few moments he does not speak. Then he bursts out laughing. I stare at him in shock, not understanding his reaction. I feel myself flush. Isn't that your real name? No, darling, it is, but hearing you say my name, well, it sounds so much more softer out of your lips. I rather like it. <laughs> my cheeks are warm again. How is it that he is always able to make me feel this way? I will call you by that name if it makes you so happy. Let's make it a secret between the two of us. I'm still Miss Karma here. Besides, I'd rather you kept that name for my ears only. It makes me feel more special that way. More special? At that moment, Garland shows up for practice and Claude politely excuses himself. I watch the two of them trade blows. Claude favors his other hand, but his blows still come quickly, even with his injury. The more comma... Karma, I mean, Claude, tells me, the more I realize that he's like me, a noble curse for being selfish. But how do I help break his curse? Why can't he tell me? As practice is drawing to a close, Claude asks Garland the usual question. Have you confessed to Jiren yet? Garland only shakes his head in reply. The two men sheave their swords. Garland looks almost sad as he turns to make his way back to the tavern. He likes her, and yet well, he won't say anything. Why is that frustrating you so much? Garland. Yes, princess? You have to tell Jurian. Claude told me before that confessing is hard, but what Garland is going through looks even harder. Princess, you know I'm incapable. No, I think you're incapable. Or I say, uh, blah, blah, blah. No, you think you're incapable, but, but if you never say anything to her, you'll never know. If I say something wrong, I risk losing everything that I already have with her. And if you say nothing, you risk losing what you could have with her. Lucette is right. Maybe you should really tell her, Garland. But before, Claude was adamant that Garland shouldn't confess to Jirian what changed. 
if I mess this up, hmm, let's try looking at it through another lens. Imagine that Jurian is Lucette. How do you think she would like to be confessed to? I frown at the two men, arms crossed. Excuse me? <laughs> well, you and Jurian are very similar. You're both very straightforward. C confess to the princess? <laughs> My eyes moved to Claude, but only fleetingly before they are once again on Garland. You just need to do something simple, Garland. Something that will not rub her the wrong way. A maiden's heart is ever fragile and each woman is different. Claude is wearing an amused smile on his face, but he is looking at me, not Garland. I feel my face flush and have to look away. Luce, your tomato red again. It's adorable. Bro. I cross my arms over my rapidly beating heart again and forced a, scowl, a scowl on my face. No, I was just thinking about what Garland could do. Something simple, like when Karma kissed my hand, I... Garland kissing Jurian's hand is probably not a good idea. Maybe he could do that... Maybe he could do what Claude and I did that one day in town. He can buy her some food and then they can just talk. Garland, have you ever asked just Jurian out for food? Not alone. Jurian is practical and she always eats at the tavern. She also... She, she's also always on duty if she's available. I'll take her patrol shift to a knife from now. Then and tomorrow you can ask her out for a meal. We can make her invite a grand affair. We can drape banners on the walls or I can give you a rose. That sounds like a terrible idea. I am offended. I feel like if I did something like that for Jiren, she would get embarrassed and punch me. Sounds like another lady that I know. Claude grins at me, but I just roll my eyes. Garland, just ask her normally, and then when you are out and alone together, you can confess. And we'll make sure you have the time to do it. I'll purposely come late to practice tomorrow night so you can ask her out for that date. How does that sound? You two really think that I can do this? You just have to ask the question. Whatever follows will at least be an answer. Tomorrow night, then. Good man, I'm sure it will go swimmingly. Or I could drown. You won't drown, Garland. Garland excuses himself with a nervous smile, before Claude turns to me expectantly with a mischievous grin. Now, Lucette, we'll come here early tomorrow and spy on them. We need to scope out a good spot. Spy on them? Of course, we need to make sure that our efforts pay off. I don't think we should. You don't want to see how it plays out? I mutely shake my head, unable to put my emotion into words. For some reason, I'm imagining myself in Jurian's position. It feels too personal. Claude's likeliness suddenly springs to my mind. I feel my face grow hot again. Lucette, you've been oddly out of it today. Claude reaches out a hand toward me, then abruptly pulls away. I stare as he smiles at me almost sheepishly. The conversation between us dies, and we return to the marchant. Days pass, and though I did not spy on the conversation between Jurian and Garland, I noticed that Garland has been smiling from ear to ear during his practice with Claude recently. I can only assume that his confession went well. Claude took the patrol shift tonight, and as I lay in bed, I am restless. Every time I watch Claude practice with Jurian and Garland, I am reminded of the palace of Fritz. I wonder how Fritz is doing. Is he still practicing with the other knights? My thoughts darken as I recall the kidnappings. Claude had to save me every single time. He got injured saving me. Unable to sleep, I slip out of bed and make my way to the reception room. The night air is cool and no one stops me from standing just outside of the marchant. I cannot sit back and uh, I cannot just sit back and do anything anymore. I have to act. I do not want Claude to get hurt because of me again. Eventually I see Claude approach. He looks tired and is moving more slowly than usual, but when he sees me, his lips quirk into a smile. Lucette, what are you doing out here tonight, love? What? <laughs> love instead of darling, that's new. Hello, Claude. Aww, his face is, his face is dark red again. <laughs> if you're using my real name, I suppose you come to ask for something serious. How can you know that? I need to do something. I need to ask something of you. Well, if you need a shoulder to cry on, I'm right here, love. What? Oh, is this not about? Never mind. I'm asking if you'll be my instructor. For some reason, I seem to have caught Claude off guard. He stares at me for a few moments. What? I want to learn how to use the sword, and I want you to be, to be my instructor. Claude's expression becomes uncharacteristically serious. I'd rather you didn't learn how to use a sword. I do not want you to keep to have to keep protecting me. I don't mind protecting you. I do. Claude sighs and, sighs and shakes his head. 
Princesses shouldn't be using swords. I want to be able to stand on my own two feet. You are. I do not want you to get hurt again when I could do something about it. Teach me, please. Claude. Oh, he's so cute. <laughs> Once again, he flushes. It seems to be an instant reaction, and it is both amusing and endearing. It won't be easy. I wasn't expecting it to be. Claude stares at me for uh, a long time before finally letting out a heavy sigh. Fine, I'll train you. You won't learn it in, in a day, but I can teach you the essentials. You can use one of the knight's training swords. That Thank you. Oh, she's smiling. Music to my ears. Meet me in the clearing in 10 minutes. 10 minutes? What? You said you wanted to train, so we will. Don't expect me to go easy on you. But aren't you tired? He looked exhausted when he came in, and, and now he wants to train? Already trying to get out of training? I'm not. Claude shakes his head, but he is smiling at me. Uh, I'll see you there in a few minutes, love. Why is he calling us that? Oh my god. <sighs> Moonlight spills through the leaves, illuminating the forest with gentle light. Long minutes pass, and as I stand in the clearing, I begin to feel restless. It isn't like Claude to be late. Is he tending to his injury? I hear a rustling in the leaves and turn immediately to see what the disturbance is, but the minute I do, I am pulled back by a strong force and my world goes dark. Oh. Before I can scream, I hear a gentle voice in my ears. Lesson 1, Lucette. When apprehended by an enemy... That you can't see or remain calm and use your five senses to judge how best to get the upper hand. This voice is coming from right behind me. Oh. <laughs> oh, Claude? I become aware that this is the closest he's ever been to me with my back pressed to his chest like this. Panicking disorients the mind. That is why you must remain cool under any circumstance. How can I not panic? Any normal person would panic. Still, I try to force myself to be calm. Lesson two, enemies will often let their guards, let down their guards when they think they have the upper hand. Catch your opponent off guard by remaining calm and locating this weakness with your senses. I try to calm myself as Claude instructs and I feel it is a bit easier, but only because I know it is Claude in opening. I move as quickly as I can, stepping forward so that I can swing an elbow back at Claude's stomach. Before that happens, Claude has pulled me back to him, closing whatever distance I had put between us. In the proce process, he moves his hand from my eyes to my mouth. I can once again see the forest, but my words are muffled beneath his hand. Another thing to remember, you won't be able to always catch your enemy off guard by throwing punches or hits at them. Your opponent will usually always be stronger than you, Lucette. Remember what I said about a weakness. Enemies will often let their guards down when they believe they are winning. Just like I have. An opening. A thought occurs to me as, as I glance around me and then down at Karma's bandaged hand. Karma's bandaged hand is around my mouth. Is this an opportunity or a trick? What will you do, princess? What kind of tactic would you remove from my grasp? By his hand. I'm going to feel terrible about this, but I have to try. I try to shift my head to get enough space to bite down, and even Claude cannot hold me completely still as I squirm. Eventually, the hand over my mouth moves just enough for me to open my mouth, but I falter. I cannot bite the hand that I injured. Unable to do anything else, I mutely shake my head and, hear, and I hear Claude groan. In one swift motion, he pushes me down to the ground, pinning my hands by my head as he frowns at me. You're not even going to try and find an opening? I glare at him. I am not going to bite your hand. Bite my hand? I didn't even think of that. But you made it obvious. You put your hand over my mouth. I meant for you to try moving my hand. Pushing back a person's thumb usually causes their grip to loosen. H how was I supposed to know that? Experience is the best means of practice, as they say. I have a complaint about that particular lesson, but I withhold it. That was a pretty good attempt, love, but not good enough, I'm afraid. I wasn't expecting you to come at me like that. I was expecting sword practice. You weren't expecting a man to kidnap you in the alleyway, were you? I glare up at him, unable to say anything because he is right. You're oddly quiet. It is hard to find opening to hurt you when you are not really my enemy. He does not move, but continues to stare at me. <laughs> His face is close to mine, close enough to- Close enough to what, exactly? Lucette, do you trust me to protect you? 
That's not the point. I need to be able to protect myself. Because you're planning on investigating the witches on your own? No, I I want to be able to protect... I want to be able to protect myself because I do not want you getting hurt protecting me. Claude leans down and I can feel his hair at my cheek. For a few moments, everything slows to a stop and all I can hear is my heartbeat and his slow breathing. Once you set your mind to something, you don't let go, do you? Bro, why did you pull away? Oh my god. Claude pulls away from me before I can respond. He's standing again, offering me a hand. Well, let's get started with some sore work then. The pleasant smile is back on his face. I can never tell what he's thinking at times like these. What are you really like, Claude? Please don't be a flashback. Oh, it's chapter seven. Uh, what does that say? Rose, uh, I don't know what that said. Thorny. When I returned to the merchant later that night, my hands are scratched and I think I might have bruises on my arm. Claude was not joking when he said he would go not go easy on me, but he did compliment me more than once. Lucette, I've hit you quite a few times and you haven't uttered a single complaint. Impressive. Crying is for the weak. Though everyone should be sleeping, I notice that the light is still on the tavern. I see Jerry and Garland up and at a table and speaking with each other and laughing. If Claude had to come back with me, he would be happy to see this. You two are still up? They are not even surprised when they turn to face me. Good days like this are even better when stretch. I haven't been off duty in a long time. Did you both have a good time tonight? It was great. Garland knows these little places in town that I've never even heard of before. I noticed that Jurian is more energetic than usual. Her smile a little wider than normal. I wonder if she's drunk. I'm going to get another drink. Another drink. Garland leans in toward me and his voice hushed. We already bought a replacement bottle when we were out today. We would never take anything from the merchant without money. Right, is Jurian drunk? Oh no, Princess Tipsy. It's a bud. Fades a lot quicker. Oh. Garland and I watch Jurian as she refills her glass at the bar. I have to thank you, Princess. I would have never asked her out if you and Karma hadn't insisted on it, so you told her. Garland looks at me with a pleased smile. I'll take that as a yes. She didn't really realize until much later. I just asked her out for food and she thought that's all it was. Maybe Jurian really needs to be told bluntly what happened. I uh, told her, <laughs> Anne. We talked and remembered old times. He sounds like an old man. And I held her hand. Oh, <laughs> you guys are so cute. I noticed Jer Garland flinch ever so slightly, but he is smiling. He looks pleased with himself. And the night's not over yet, so. He trails off with a hopeful smile before he raises his eyebrows at me. What about you and Karma? What about us? I've asked him to train me. Train, princess, you've asked him to teach you how to use a sword? What's this? Our princess is going to pick up a sword? <laughs> Rajurian returns to the table, but I am too tired to properly join in the conversation. I should lead them to their conversation and head to bed. I need some I need to get some rest if I want to start practicing at night. I excuse myself to head upstairs. Oh, we got a good deed. I'm startled awake by an excruciating bright light. It is momentary, momentary and when it is over, I am sitting in my, in my bed, dazed and confused. My eyes burn. My hand flies to the pendant around my neck where I see the second glass slipper with another piece. Girl, we got one more and then we broke our curse. Hey, <laughs> there's another piece. But when did I do another good deed? I grasp the necklace tightly in my hand as I make my way to the tavern. Everyone is doing their pre-morning chores when I get to the tavern area. I notice Karma glaring off into space and then not far from him the two nights. They haven't been up all night, have they? I make my way slowly over to them. Even back then, you were like some kind of shadow, weren't you? <laughs> you don't have to hide it. It was obvious you were tailing me back then. It, it was only because I was worried about you. I realize you really didn't have to follow me, Lon, but I'm glad you did. Lon? Jurian. Oh, shush. Fritz used to call you that, too. Lon is Garland's childhood nickname. He still gets embarrassed when I call him that. I see. So, what are you two talking about? Oh, we were just reminiscing. Um, 
I look at the two of them critically for a few moments, waiting for them to say something. They both exchange a glance before looking at me confused. Well? Well, what? How did your date go last night? Garland makes a sound and turns to be red. Jorian's eyebrows quirk and then she laughs. Oh, that? It went well. well. So well, in fact, that you can see the two of us are still very much enjoying each other's company. Jorani is usually busy taking her rounds around the march with a scowl on her face. She looks happier being here with Garland, more relaxed. You might even say that we're dating. Oh, oh my god. Isn't it funny how ready gets princess? You were blushing just as much yesterday when I... One more lord, Lon and I swear I'll punch you. <laughs> the two of them are blushing now and the scene is oddly comical. Who knew that the two great knights of the Order of Caldear could be so easily undone? Both of you are amusing to watch. The two of them stare at me suddenly solemn face. I suddenly remember that one conversation the knights all had at the castle. They were talking about how they all had personal reasons for being knights, despite the fact they all served the king. I had always thought Jurian and Garland were stoic and honorable, and that their only reason for becoming knights was a sense of justice. Seeing them here, though, without that stark facade, they feel more like people. My curiosity is petite. Do you mind if I ask what your reason were for becoming knights? Oh, my father was a knight. He put his life on the line for this kingdom. Jurian's father was a living legend in his own right, and he had the mills to back it up. My father wasn't around a lot, but I always admired him. Judging by the look on Jurian's face, it is, it is clear to me that she really loves her father. My mother died when I was young, and because my father couldn't be around all the time to take care of me, I ended up practically living with Lon and his family. Lon always got annoyed when I called him my brother. <laughs> now I know why. <laughs> Jurian wanted to follow in her father's footsteps. Then why did you join the Knights, Garland? Because he wanted to watch over me. I, I, I never knew you blushed so easily, Garland. <laughs> Garland seems to blush even harder at that, and Jurian's laughter becomes infectious. I feel amused and begin to bubble up as I watch the two of them. But a cold voice cuts through the laughter, and the atmosphere, like a hot blade through ice. Could you keep it down over there? What? I turn and see that Claude's eyes, normally so warm or cold, his usual smile is gone, replaced with a deep scowl. Oh, we're sorry. He's still glaring at the two of them. Oh, I can tell about the necklace. Claude, karma, I got another piece of my necklace, another good deed. Claude turns his gaze to me, but the frown doesn't disappear. That's nice, darling. His voice is calm but flat and lacks any enthusiasm. That felt lackluster and oddly disappointing. A good deed. Congratulations, Prince, as you're close to breaking your curse. What did you get the good deed for? I'm not sure, actually. Hmm, maybe it was help for helping Long confess. I hear you and Karma went out of your way to help make it happen. That happened yesterday, though. Maybe the magic was waiting to see what became of Garland and I? Claude makes a dismissive, dismissive hand gesture from his table, frowning. If you two insist on being so affectionate, you should get a room. Affectionate? Jurian's smile has faded away into a dangerous scowl. Where Garland be looks confused, Jurian looks notably irritated. The shadow is still there on his face. Claude does not look okay at all. What is going on with him, bro? Like, weren't you just fine, like, yesterday? No, you're scolding him. It doesn't matter if something's bothering him. It doesn't like him to be so rude. Irritation is no excuse for rudeness. Fine, I apologize. Happy? He looks at me for a few moments, his expression twisted into a defiant scowl but doesn't hold long. Moments later, his expression softens and he looks away almost in shame. I'm sorry. This apology sounds real, but still, why do I feel so disappointed? Silence descends for a few moments before Claude abruptly stands up from his table. Excuse me. Claude turns briskly and heads upstairs, leaving me with the two knights. I wonder what's wrong with him. You think we've been running him too thin because of practice? I do not think it's you two. I get the feeling that Claude holds himself back from saying what he means sometimes. Sometimes he acts strange, distant, and recently he's getting more and more moody. Um, princess? I look over at Anise, who is smiling apologetically. Sorry to interrupt, but Mr. Bruce is getting kind of restless. <laughs> Time to sweep, I suppose. Well, maybe cleaning will help get my mind off of things. 
The rest of the day goes by slowly. I am stuck cleaning most of the day and then serving later. At one point, I speak with Delora about the knights that had attempted to kidnap me, and she tells me that she and Parfair are meeting later to discuss their suspicions. I still don't... I still don't... Oh my god. I still don't understand what their suspicions are when Sir Alcaster cannot possibly know who I am. You're forgetting about Fritz! My hands are sore by the end of the night, but I still feel like I can practice with a sword. I notice that both Jurian and Garland look restless too. Garland eventually leaves, leaves for patrol while Jurian remain, remains at a table looking deep in thought. I do not want to bother her, so I just start, decide to go or decide to try and find Claude. I go to his room but find that the door is locked. Claude, Karma, are we training tonight? No answer. My heart sinks. Is he not speaking to me? Did I do something wrong? Girl, you know what? Screw him. He can suck it. For days, Claude stayed in his room, only leaving when he had to be on patrol. A few times, I saw Parfait go into his room, but she refuses to talk about what is going or what is bothering him. I feel so useless. When Claude did appear in the tavern or out in, in the town, he still had that terrible grimace on his face. Look, I really don't want to talk right now. If you're so frustrated with me, why not just ignore me? No, I'm not going to train tonight. I'm not in the right state of mind. I don't want to talk about it. Just leave me alone, please. I'm really beginning to worry about him. Today I'm running, or er, today I'm in town running errands with, Parf with, oh my God, with Waltz for Parfait. It has been almost a week since Claude started acting so strangely. So I thought I needed to do something for him. I know he likes dresses and he told me once that he likes roses, but can I really find him, find something that will cheer him up? Perhaps you would like some jewelry. Well, do so you remember where that jewelry store Claude or Karma likes is? I don't go there very often, so unfortunately, no. Princesses, is this a good deed? Hmm? What you're doing right now, do you think it would be a good deed? Good deeds need to be selfless, right? Generally, yes. I doubt this will count as selfless i am doing this to cheer karma up that sounds pretty selfless but it's also so that he goes back to teaching me how to fight instead of sulking in his room i've heard that karma has been teaching you how to use a sword why do you want to learn how to fight because i want to be able to protect myself and it's not like i can use magic at least sword fighting gives me an advantage i'm sorry princess i wish i could teach you magic but it doesn't work when you're under a curse but on your 18th birthday, when you become the Ten of Baron Barrow, you'll be able to use magic. I'll instruct you if you want me to. That would, would be nice. Though that does not solve my current problem. What would cheer Claude up? Walt starts chuggling beside me and I turn to look at him confused. Karma is important to you, isn't he? He is my partner and he's helped me. He has also been patient with me and smiled even when I've said some really inconsiderate things to him. I'm glad, Princess, that he's your friend. My friend. Claude does not feel like a friend. He feels like something else. Oh, princess, is this the one you were searching for? Waltz points to a peddler sporting different kinds of jewelry, and I instantly make my way toward it. There are all kinds of glaring things displayed, and for a few moments, I feel myself drawn to everything. Then I notice the price, ta price tags. I barely have any money left from when the king gave me that pouch. I cannot afford any of this. Maybe we should go do our errands first and then look for a gift. Maybe we'll find something as we look through the stores. But if I don't get Kit Claude's gift today, I might not be able to give it to him tonight. Princess. Oh. Um, let's... No, let's go do errands. Walt has a good point. We might find something while we do the errands and then we can get them out of the way. Besides, it is not right for me to put Claude above everyone else. We spent a few hours gathering the supplies needed for the tavern, and only then did we start looking again for Claude's gift. Princess, I can hold more of those bags for you. It's fine. I'm used to carrying around lots of bags. Does Carmen make you carry them around? Princess, you should really tell him off. He does a lot of other things for me, but next time, next time I think I will. So long as he gets out of his room sometime soon. I really hope he does. Hey, Princess. Now, the problem is finding something that he'll like. What does Claude like? Princess. There's a reason for you to shout. 
Walsh shakes his head at me, but he's smiling. Let me offer you a deal. A deal? If you help me set up one of my puppet shows, I'll pay you. You earn money from your puppet shows? I get tips, so what do you say? I won't go easy on you, though. Yes, I'll help you. Oh, he's shocked. Why do you seem so surprised? I was just thinking that everyone's right. You've really changed, princess. Maybe having Karma as a partner really was a good idea. Being partners with Claude may have changed me for the better, but I doubt I've done the same for him. I'm sure Karma would be very happy that you were buying him a gift. Receiving gifts from admirers and this isn't the same thing as you getting him something. He receives gifts from admirers? For a few moments, I think about the women who chased us in town a couple weeks ago, and I feel a little unpleasant stab in my heart. Small things. A man will treat him to a dessert every so often. I saw a lot of it when we did errands together. I always make karma expect accept those gifts without killing the man. Killing the man is dramatic, but it sounds like karma. He punched Rumple when he asked to marry him, joke or not. Karma wears his disguise to be convincing, but then gets angry when people fall for it. He is so very much he is still very much a child. You know how he is. He doesn't like being flirted with. Waltz, do you know anything else about Karma's curse? His curse? His num he never really talked about it. Claude may even be more stubborn than me if he is not letting anyone help him with his curse. Waltz and I continue our search for a gift. Waltz tells me that I can look for something a bit more expensive and that he'll just put me to work on another day by helping him with his puppets. I return to the jewelry peddler we found earlier. Hello, madam, sir. What can I help you with today? Do you have any sort of rose-shaped jewelry here? The man refers me to a box full of many different rose-colored, or many rose-shaped earrings. He then shows me necklaces, and I realize blatantly that it is, it is as if I am searching for something from his karma, not Claude. My eyes scan the glass nearly in defeat before a little rose catches my attention in the back of the display window. It has a chain connected to it, but doesn't seem long enough to be a necklace. What's that one? That's our simple rose pendant, madam. It comes with a chain, but it can also be pinned on the chest. The man takes it out of the display so I can look at it. Ooh, that's pretty. This is fancy, but not completely flashy. I feel a little click as I press my fingers to the pendant, and I realize that it, is, it can also open. Oh yes, you can also put something small inside of it. This is perfect. I look at the price tag, and after making sure it is not too expensive, I pay the shopkeeper. Waltz pays him the additional fee, and then we walk back to, toward the marchant together. When we return to the marchant, I go to my room to tuck the locket into a drawer before I head to the tavern and finish the rest of my chores. Just as I expected, Claude isn't downstairs today either. Jurian and Garland have taken training with each other, though they seem agitated that Claude is not helping them. At the end of the day, I hurry to my room, where I write a few words on a piece of paper that I put into the locket. Our normal rose would have withered, so I offer this one instead in heartful thanks. I hold the lock tightly in my hand and start toward Claude's room. Why is my heart beating him beating so fast? I'm just giving him a gift. I pawed at Claude's door, remembering the last time I entered his room. I am sure if it's okay if I just go in. I open up the door to Claude's room, which is thankfully not locked and step inside. Claude is sitting motionless in front of his mirror, shoulders slumped as he stares at his reflection. He's shirtless, and there's that tattoo. It seems different. Claude does not notice me at first. I notice that his hand goes over to goes to the tattoo over his chest, and then I hear him heave a heavy sigh. Slowly, I close the door behind me. It clicks, clicks, and that is when he suddenly turns to look at me. At first, there is a shock on his face, and then suddenly anger. Again, why do you have to do this again, Lucette? <sighs> God, bro. Um. I came to speak with you. I came to give him something, but I also want to speak with him. I haven't seen Claude in a while. Why? Because you've been doing everything by yourself lately? You came to complain? No, I wanted to check on you. Princess, can you not read the mood? You could at the very least not. Oh, hi. In no time at all, Claude is suddenly right in front of me, his hands outstretched on either side of me, pinning me to the wall against the door. 
His face is so close, his expression so fierce that I cannot even bring myself to think of a way out. The only thing I can do is stare at him lovely, without getting angry, without crying. I will not show any weakness. Why? Why aren't you struggling or screaming at me? That's the that's what the Lusa I that I know would do. Then you do not know me as much as you think you do, and you know nothing about me. I already have a retort prepared when I stop, realizing that he is right. I barely know anything about him. No, I don't, but I'd like to. Why do you insist on poking your nose in others' business? Why? Why are you being like this? We're partners. That's the only reason it has to be. I am supposed to help you, so why do you keep secrets from me? Help me. His lips quirk, but his smile is sardonic. Claude, I want to help you. In the silence that descends between us, I find that I cannot help but look at Claude's tattoo, at the thorns twirling around the rose. It is beautiful, but it also seems so lethal. Oh. When I glance at Claude again, he looks crestfallen, his eyes glaring like he might be on the verge of tears. Secrets are secrets for a reason, princess. You should know that. If I could speak about them, I would, but I can't. And you bursting into my room wouldn't, without any notice only makes it harder. Harder for what? Princess, you can't imagine what this all feels like. What is he talking about? And that woman, I thought we were meant to be- What? She was so lovely, her smile as bright as the sun. Claude's eyes are far away. That's why, never again. But then you ruined everything, Lucette. You cut me down like, you little mother. Mm. I pushed my hands against Claude's chest, catching him off guard and forcing him to stumble back. I cannot take any of this. Girl, you better leave. If I ruin everything, then now just leave. You can have all the time in the world to yourself then. The locket I bought for him burns in my hand and I end up throwing it at his feet. Lucette, wait. I ignore him as I run from the room. When I return to my room and lock my door, I feel too hollow inside for tears. It hurts to breathe when I think of Claude. Oh my god, what is this boy doing? I eventually manage to fall asleep, but only have snatches of restless dreams with my eyes finally closed. Oh, another flashback. Mother, are you and father in true love like the fairy tales? I thought it forbid you to speak of the fairy tales. Have you been reading them? N no matter. I overheard someone in the palace talking about them today. Then I shall have to find that person to make sure they know what an appropriate topic of conversation in the, pa in the palace is. But mother, the true love and fairy tales sound so nice. Do you think I could fall in love, fall in true love with a prince? Dearest one, true love like that does not exist. But. The love between a mother and her child is the truest kind. It cannot be replicated by anything else. All the other kinds of love is an illusion. My love is all you will ever need. Do you understand me, my heart? Yes, mother. My god. Chapter 8, The Lost Prince. Keep your stance straight, princess. Durian gives me the warning, but too late on purpose. I can see the smile on her face as she effortlessly slides past my defenses and taps me on the shoulder with her wooden sword. I got you. Again. For the last few days, I have been practicing with Jurian and Garland because Claude still hasn't come out of his room. The knights offer to train me and right now they are teaching me about ways to hold a sword. This is slow, but Claude did tell me he wouldn't be able to master the sword so quickly. Claude. He made me so angry that one day that I could not even properly give him my gift. Yeah, I still feel sad that he is not here teaching me himself. Come on, princess, focus. I jolt out of my reverie, not at Jurian. Oh, okay. I ready myself for our next strike and once again get tapped, this time on the hip. Garland takes over after Jurian and then we do rounds where I try to hit them with certain strikes. They are both good at teaching, but it does not feel the same as Claude's instruction. His lessons seem less like they were out of a book. Don't worry, princess, it always starts out slow. Lom was just as slow as training, but look at him now. Garland whips his head around in Jurian's direction, his face turning deep red. Jurian, that nickname. But you're so much fun to tease, Lon. <laughs> she beams at him and then laughs at his embarrassed face. Our practice goes on for a few more minutes before the right. The knights tell me to wrap it up for the night. 
I think I'm going to stay out here for a little bit. Princess, you know it's out here, or you know it's dangerous out here at night. If I don't return in 10 minutes, you can come back and check on me. Jurian seems unconvinced, but she eventually nods. Fine, but keep your guard up, princess. I watch the two knights as they head back. I see Garland put his arm around Jurian's waist, pulling her closer. I turn away from the sight, ignoring the heavy feeling in my stomach. I'll just practice the swings for five more minutes. The only thing I hear in the clearing while I practice is my shallow breathing and the wind in my ears. Something breaks my concentration, however. I see a, col a glimmer of color in the forest, and I instantly stop, my hands growing tense on the wooden sword. Oh my god, what was that? I glance around at my surroundings, and then I freeze when I feel a hand on my shoulder. I can feel someone's breath down my neck. This all feels too familiar. Is this Claude? Um, try and point your sword at him. I am pretty sure I recognize Claude's hand, but because I know it's him, I'd also want—I also know what he'd want me to do. I duck away from my, his hand and turn quickly to point my sword. The tip of the wood is at his neck, and for a few stunned moments, I think I've won. Even Claude looks surprised. It's really him. But then, Claude's hands have moved, and he has one hand over my wrist and the other on my sword. Good, Lucette. You realize you had an opening, but you broke your concentration in Claude. Claude removes his hands, allowing me to lower my sword. I'm sorry, Lucette. I feel my breath catching my throat when Claude holds out the rose pendant that I got for him. I feel my cheeks flush. You accidentally left this beautiful thing in my room when I... Well, I came to return it. Return it? Yes, you left it in my room and I, so I only thought it appropriate to bring it back to you. Does you really think I left it there on accident? Why would I leave it on, in your room on accident? What? I bought it for you and I wanted to give it to you, but you were acting so strangely and... Claude's eyes widen, the surprise clear on his face. Lucette, you bought this for me? Why does he look so shocked? Claude looks at me in awe for a few moments. His eyes go back down to the locket. He traces a finger around the intricate shape, his eyebrows slowly furring. It's to thank you for everything you've done for me. Lucette, this is beautiful. He lets the chain fall through his fingers as he stares at the rose pendant with adoration. I feel my heartbeat stutter as he turns to regard me with the same gentle smile. He leans forward and my breathing stops as he reaches out to hold up my glass slipper necklace. He's standing so close to me. <laughs> you really are a good person, Lucette. You completed your second good deed. I think some kind of a congratulations is in order. Is there anything you want me that I can give to you? I look up at him and notice that Claude smiles and reaches his eyes. He still looks so sad. I feel like there is so much that I want from Claude, but I do not want to ask for something that might make him sad. I want a hug. Huh? Claude looks at me in surprise. He thinks I'm being foolish for making such a request, doesn't he? I shouldn't have said anything. But before I can say anything else, Claude takes a step forward and wraps me in his arms. He pulls me toward him and in those moments of silence, all I can hear is his heartbeat resounding in his chest. I can feel his warmth all around me and his fingers clasp gently in my back. I feel so strange. My heart is racing and my knees feel weak. <laughs> Something like this. <laughs> These two are so cute. Oh my god, he's blushing. Bro. He speaks right into my ear. It is a surprisingly pleasant feeling. Suddenly, Claude makes a noise of distress as he steps away from me. All of the warmness that was pressed against me one moment ago is gone. Oh. Karma suddenly stops eyes wide. He puts his hand on his chest and takes a step away from me, his fingers clutching at the fabric of his shirt. Claude has a pained expression on his face, only making me more anxious. Not now. Claude, are you okay? What's wrong? Oh, Lucette, don't, don't worry about it. He lowers his hand with the pained smile slowly fading from his face. This does little to reassure me. Was it my fault you were locked in your room for so long? He, look, he just looks so pained to be anywhere near me. No, most definitely not. I was feeling under the weather. And also bitter. Bitter? Why would he feel bitter? 
But it's not for you to worry about, darling. For now, we should head back. It's late and you need rush. I guess I just got back from patrol, so I would like to rest as well. Is is there anything else I can do for you? No, sweet Lucette, you've already done enough for me. He clutches the rose locket to his chest and sighs out a little with a gentle smile. The smile feel feels real to me. This is a beautiful gift and I will treasure it always. Thank you, Lucette. Now, shall we head back? I nod at him and we silently walk back to the march inn. We, when we make it back to the tavern, I feel tired, but also lighter than I have for weeks. Claude wishes me a good night before slowly walking off to his room, holding the rose locket that I gave him tightly. Let's go.